In this video, we'll introduce the Lovas Local Lemma, or LLL, which is a powerful tool for the probabilistic method. Before we introduce the Lovas Local Lemma, let's start with some motivation. Consider the k-satisfiability problem, or k-sat. Here, we are given a formula phi in conjunctive normal form. So phi looks like this. It's the and of a bunch of clauses, where each clause is the or of a bunch of literals. Here, by literal, I just mean like a variable x2, or maybe the negation of a variable, like here is not x6. In ksat, there are k literals per clause. So this picture is an example of 3sat. And for this video, I'm going to say that there are m clauses. The question is, is phi satisfiable? That is, is there some way to assign true-false values to the variables x1, x2, and so on, so that the formula phi evaluates to true? What would the probabilistic method do here? To show that phi is satisfiable, we could first choose a random assignment, x, and second, show that phi of x is true with positive probability. If we could do that, that would mean that there exists a satisfying assignment x, and in particular, phi is satisfiable. Does this work? Well, let's try. Here's a first try. Let's define a sub i to be the event that the ith clause is unsatisfied. We think of a sub i as a bad event. We want to show that with positive probability, no bad event occurs. That is, all of the clauses are satisfied. In this case, the probability that ai occurs, the probability that the ith clause is unsatisfied, is equal to p, where p is 1 divided by 2 to the k. That is because there are 2 to the k possible ways to assign the k variables, and only one of them is bad, assuming that we have k distinct variables in each clause. By the union bound over all m clauses, the probability that none of the ai occur is at least 1 minus m times p, where m is the number of clauses. Thus, if m is less than 1 over p, there exists a satisfying assignment. That's kind of neat. That means that any formula with not too many clauses is satisfiable. On the other hand, what happens if m is greater than 1 over p? What can we do then? As a thought experiment, let's give it a second try. The second try is going to be incorrect, but it's just for intuition. As before, let ai be the bad event that the ith clause is unsatisfied, so that the probability that ai occurs is p, where p is 1 over 2 to the k. Now, let's pretend that the ai are independent. They are not independent. Uh, if this isn't clear, pause the video until you see why. Okay, so under this false assumption that the ai are independent, the probability that none of the ai hold is just equal to 1 minus p to the m. If m is large, this is a very, very tiny number, but it's always strictly greater than 0. This would imply that there exists a satisfying assignment for phi, or in other words, that phi is satisfiable. If only we had this independence. Okay, obviously this doesn't work. Not only is our assumption not true, the conclusion is not true. It's not the case that every single formula is satisfiable. But it does turn out that if the dependence isn't too bad, it still sort of works. And this leads us to the Lovas Local Lemma, or LLL. The LLL says the following. Suppose that I have m bad events, a1 through am. So think of these like the ith clause is not satisfied. And they have the properties that for all i, first the probability of the event ai is at most p, and second, that the event ai is mutually independent, not of all of the other events, but most of them, all but d other events for some parameter d. What does it mean to be mutually independent? Informally, this means that if I remove just d other events, what's left are going to be independent from ai. Formally, this means that there exists some set s, a subset of 1 through m, other than i, of size at most d, 
so that for any set d so that for any set t also a subset of 1 through m other than i which does not intersect s the probability that the event ai occurs conditioned on aj not occurring for any j and t is just equal to the probability that ai occurs that is, whatever's going on with the events indexed by this set T don't affect the event AI. Just to note, this is kind of a convoluted way of defining mutually independent, but this is the way that's going to be useful a little bit later on. As an example of this, let's consider the KSAT example we just saw. So if the AI are indicator random variables for whether or not the ith clause is unsatisfied, and if it happens to be the case that there are at most d clauses that share a variable with clause i, then ai is mutually independent from all but d other events. OK, so back to the statement of the lemma. These were just the hypotheses. Suppose we have these bad events, each of which is not too likely and each of which is mutually independent of all but d other events. So there's not too many dependencies going on. Then the conclusion is the following. Actually, there are two versions that we'll list here. There are even more versions. We might see another one in class. Version 1 says that if p times d is less than or equal to 1 fourth, then the probability that none of the ai occur is greater than or equal to 1 minus 2p to the m, which in particular is strictly greater than zero. Version two is similar. It says that if p times d plus one is at most one over e, then the probability that none of the ai occur is greater than or equal to one minus one over d plus one, all raised to the m, which again, while it might be tiny, is strictly greater than zero. What both of these versions are saying is that as long as d isn't too big, like it's on the order of 1 over p, then we get the same conclusion that we got on the previous slide when we were assuming that everything was independent. That is, there's some positive probability that no event occurs. Intuitively, as long as the dependence is local enough, meaning that no event is dependent on too many other events, then they might as well be independent as far as this calculation is concerned. Let's take just a moment to interpret this quantitative result. So let's focus on version 2. Suppose that there are only d plus 1 dependent events, say ai and the d events that it's dependent with. Then the union bound argument that we saw at the beginning of this video shows that the probability that none of the ai occur is at least 1 minus d plus 1 times p, which is strictly greater than 0 if p times d plus 1 is strictly less than 1. So what we're seeing here with this hypothesis is that we've really just taken a hit of a factor of 1 over e relative to what this union bound would give. And in exchange, what we've gotten is the ability to generalize beyond just d plus 1 events. We have these d plus 1 dependent events which are part of a much bigger system of events, possibly with a very complicated dependency structure. So that's pretty cool. To recap, the Lovos local lemma says that if a collection of bad events aren't too dependent, meaning that the dependencies are somewhat local, then there is some positive probability that none of those bad events occur. We started this discussion with the motivating example of KSAT, where the bad events are unsatisfied clauses. So what does the Lovos local lemma imply for KSAT? Qualitatively, it implies that if no clause shares variables with too many other clauses, then the formula is satisfiable. Quantitatively, well, we'll work it out in class. In the next video, though, we will prove the Lovos local lemma. See you there.